my talk tonight will probably run between 50 and 55 minutes. I'll be holding you prisoner for uh, that length of time. But the good news is that you will then be able to hold me hostage for as long as you'd like. And I will be delighted to answer your questions. Um, I'd like to begin by also mentioning that uh, one of the uh, sort of unmentioned perks of this talk is that all of the attendees will be inducted into the Bavarian Illuminati and will be welcome to join me in a blood sacrifice at an undisclosed location somewhere down the line. Uh, my lecture is called Suspicious Minds, how RFK Jr., Naomi Wolf, and a liberal media critic ended up on the same page as a QAnon cultist whose book reads like Don DeLillo on DMT. On January 6th, the barbarians were inside the gates, mugging for selfies, live streaming themselves as they pillaged the Capitol and hunted for Vice President Pence, House Speaker Pelosi, and other traitors on their lynch mob bucket list. They smeared excrement on carpets, wiped blood on the bust of President Zachary Taylor, trashed offices in search of the smoking gun they knew, just knew, was there somewhere irrefutable evidence of the conspiracy to steal the election from Donald J. Trump. Now, the barbarian trope was the insurrection's defining meme. In The New Yorker, Luke Mogelson noted that Trump, whom he believed had emboldened the most deranged and hateful elements of the American right, unquote, had retweeted a QAnon supporter's splutterings. Quote, it was a rigged election, but they were busted. Sting of the century. Justice is coming. A few weeks later, Mogelson wrote, a barbarian with a spear, that is the photogenic QAnon shaman, was sitting in the vice president's chair. Quote, we reclaimed our capital just to be slandered by the media, lamented Jerry Edward Riles, an apprentice electrician from Oklahoma in a Facebook post. We are not animals. We are not barbarians. We are the heart of this country and the last ones to stand up for your freedom. Now, if the rioters were barbarians, they were the barbarians next door. According to a study by the University of Chicago, 95% of them were white, 85% were male. Most of them were unemployed. Fear of the Great Replacement, as it's called, was the single biggest driver of their fear and fury. And for those of you unfamiliar with it, the Great Replacement theory promoted by attacking heads such as Tucker Carlson and embraced by white nationalists like the Tiki Torch Nazis who chanted, you will not replace us at the 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, is the conspiratorial nightmare that immigration policies favored by Democrats are designed, as Carlson put it, to, quote, change the racial mix of the country, replacing, quote, legacy Americans with more obedient people from faraway countries who will presumably do dark Brandon's bidding. Now, risible as this sounds, especially to the OG legacy Americans, which is to say indigenous people who in their earliest encounters with pale-faced people from faraway countries found them to be anything but obedient, the great replacement theory is no laughing matter. The mass shooter who slaughtered 11 congregants in a Pittsburgh synagogue in 2018 was motivated by it as was the terrorist who blew away 51 Muslims in Christchurch, New Zealand in 2019. His deranged manifesto was in fact titled The Great Replacement. And later that same year, the killer who targeted Latino shoppers at a Walmart in El Paso, Texas, killing 23. He too wrote a manifesto in which he invoked the Great Replacement theory and frothed about his fear of a brown planet. 
i.e., quote, the Hispanic invasion of Texas. If you don't fight like hell, Trump goaded the mob on January 6, you're not going to have a country anymore. This is our America, the insurrectionists chanted, once they breached the Capitol. As Mogelson observed in his New Yorker article, quote, there was an unmistakable subtext as the mob inside the Capitol, almost entirely white, shouted, whose house, our house, whose house, our house. And if that didn't say the quiet part loud, the proliferation of Confederate flags did. Of course, 90% of them were quote unquote normal Trump supporters, as a Voice of America story put it, with masterful irony. Doctors, lawyers, architects, business owners, the angry white guy next door, in other words, his extinction anxiety brought to a boil by the so called browning of America, his ideological tribalism dialed up to 11 by right-wing media's nonstop hate-mongering about BLM, Antifa, cancel culture, transgender activists, a Democratic Party infested by pedophilic groomers, and never forget the red menace of socialism. What we are dealing with here is not merely a mix of right-wing organizations, the Chicago study concluded, but a broader mass movement with violence at its core. Now, to be sure, the insurrectionists were heterogeneous in their cultural politics, anti-government, yet go figure, hyper-patriotic militias like the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters and frat boy fascists like the Proud Boys led the charge. On their heels came the foot soldiers of Christian nationalism on the march against godless secularism. QAnon cultists, true believers in the conspiracy Q warned us about, a devil-worshipping cabal of cannibalistic pedophiles in the democratic elite, that is the real power, the deep state behind our sham democracy. And of course, rank and file Trumpers caught up in the madness of crowds. Trumpism, a tribal bellow of white rage and reaction was their common bond. Yet rather than confront the hard truth of the white collar, white supremacist next door, some media outlets chose to exoticize the insurrectionists, rendering them reassuringly other. Many in the press and the commentariat seized on the QAnon shaman, aka Jacob Chansley, the bare-chested barbarian dude having an excellent adventure in Pence's chair as the poster loon for Trump's idiocracy. Brandishing a spear and sporting Nordic tattoos, which are popular on the neo-pagan far right, and a fur headdress with horns, Chansley was catnip to media outlets. Was he a burning man bro gone ultra maga? Adam Ant on ayahuasca, or as one YouTube wag put it, what you get when, quote, you throw a Republican, a ton of shrooms in MDMA, a scratch DVD of Vikings season one, and a sweaty yoga mat into a boiling pot. Whatever he was, he made great copy. No coverage of the insurrection was complete without a photo of him rampaging through the halls, sitting in Vice President Pence's chair on the Senate dais, or leading the assembled rioters in a bullhorn-assisted prayer, thanking God for allowing him and his fellow, quote-unquote, patriots to, quote, allow us to send a message to all the tyrants, the communists, and the globalists that this is our nation, not theirs. Curious to know if Chansley really is emblematic of what might be called the batshit style in American politics. I bought a copy of his book, One Mind at a Time, A Deep State of Illusion. Self-published in 2020 under the name Jacob Angeli. And here's some back cover comp copy with a biography of Angeli written by himself and a blurb promising to expose the deep state in detail. 
and paint a very clear picture as to the goings on at the highest levels of elected and unelected power. I wasn't surprised by the misspellings and grammar glitches. Chansley is a college dropout, smarter than his persona suggests and a better writer than some of the undergrads I've taught, but hobbled by the spotty literacy of the autodidact. For example, Hitler's minister of propaganda is Joseph Gerbils, the civil rights icon known for his I have a dream speech is Martian Luther King Jr. As well, I expected the weird syncretism of New Age spirituality and right-wing conspiracy theory that scholars of American religion have dubbed conspirituality. And for those of you unfamiliar with the T term, conspirituality is kind of a Venn diagram of the New Age represented uh, on the bro side of the equation by Burning Man, and on the white women in yoga pants side of the equation by Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop community. And because of their interest in wellness, um, alternative medicine, there's a tendency to go down the anti-vaxxer rabbit hole and from there into QAnon. So both of those constituencies have been a feeder mechanism for QAnon and conspiracy theory more generally. And Jacob and Jelly, aka Chansley, uh, was very much a product of that. And he's also a proponent of ayahuasca and a great believer in uh, magic mushrooms, which is neither here nor there, but simply uh, yet more proof that demographically he is a full Bernie man bro. Now, uh, Chansley, after all, is a man who describes himself as a shamanic practitioner, quote, QAnon digital soldier, New Age energy healer, and God-loving, country-protecting patriot of the USA. Quote, what we did on January 6th was an evolution in consciousness, he told the Washington Post, because as we marched down the street shouting USA or shouting things like freedom, we were actually affecting the quantum realm. Deepak Chopra meet QAnon. One mind at a time outlies a unified field theory of power, paranoia, and sinister myth because, of course, it does. Belief in one conspiracy theory is a reliable predictor of belief in others, according to a 2013 study published in Frontiers in Psychology. Even if the other theories you believe in are mutually contradictory. Thus, those who believe that Diana, Princess Diana, faked her own death, wrote the study's authors, are also more likely to believe that she was murdered. What a conspiracist believes, believes in deep down isn't conspiracy so much as conspiracism. Defined by the historian Frank P. Mintz, who coined the term as the, quote, belief in the primacy of conspiracies in the unfolding of history, conspiracism breeds conspiracy theories. It's the meta narrative suspicious minds use to make sense of the world. A significant part of that sense making consists of sleuthing out the connections between seemingly unrelated things. And I'll just add that in this regard, um, unfortunately, in terms of evolutionary psychology, human beings have a neurocognitive bias that makes them vulnerable to conspiracy theory. And that bias expresses itself in two well-known phenomena, pareidolia and apophenia. And pareidolia is the tendency to see faces based on the prefrontal cortex's evolutionarily determined bias to imposing human faces on sort of inchoate or miasmic or ill-defined visual phenomena. The classic example, of course, is the face on Mars, uh, which is in fact simply a depression and several promontories um, on the Martian landscape if you don't see it. Here's a closer shot. Another uh, wonderful example that has recently been making the rounds on Twitter is the Rosette Nebula in the Milky Way. 
I defy you not to see a sinister death's head or skull in that cloud of interstellar gas, dust, and stars. So periodolia and apophenia put us at neurocognitive risk um, about, uh, of uh, conspiracy theorizing because Homo sapiens is a storytelling animal and a pattern-making animal. Pattern recognition is what we do. And conspiracism is all about connections, historical connections spanning centuries, social networks linking, se linking secret societies, shadowy figures, government agencies, alien entities. Chansley's book, One Mind at a Time, teams with visions of top secret underground bases and networks of subterranean tunnels. These tropes give metaphoric shape to the paranoid epistemology of conspiracism, which assumes that the real purpose of official narratives is to bury darker truths and to deny the hidden connections between them. Now, true to form, Chansley connects the dots between Yale's secretive skull and bone society, long recognized as a feeder mechanism for the CIA, MK Ultra, the CIA's notorious experiment in better brainwashing through LSD, Nikola Tesla, quote, reptilians from the Draco star system, unquote, quote, the artificial monolith found on Mars's moon Phobos, the horrors of fluoridation, the depravity of the royal family, Jeffrey Epstein, Jeffrey Dahmer, and of course the Freemasons and the Illuminati, because no meta-conspiracy theory that claims to detangle the Gordian knot binding all conspiracies is complete without them. And that desire to construct a meta-narrative um, neatly tying together all the disparate, far-flung, myriad uh, narratives of individual conspiracy theories is known among conspiracy theory theorists as fusion paranoia. For those of you unfamiliar with the Illuminati, um, they were a handful of scholars who formed a secret society to promote rationalism, empiricism, and secularism, ironically, in 18th century Bavaria, where the Catholic Church was fighting a rearguard battle against the Enlightenment. When, and they chose in one of their pamphlets, which you see here as their emblem, the Owl of Minerva, um, from, I believe it's Hegel's famous, uh, beautifully poetic line, that at the end of an age when doom is in the air and things feel eschatological or apop apocalyptic, that is when we most need uh, the wise counsel of philosophy. And as Hegel put it, the owl of Minerva takes flight at twilight, the twilight of the age. Now, the irony is that when the French Revolution happened and French clerics fled to England, some of them, um, and British conservatives, the nascent Tories, were petrified that the French uh, plague of libertinism and Jacobinism would make its way across the channel, um, they clung to or embraced uh, a series of pamphlets and monographs that were written blaming the French Revolution on the Illuminati, whom they reconceptualized as a nefarious secularist society dedicated to bringing down uh, societal morality and religion and all of its works and ways. So what began as a rationalist, empiricist, and secularist academic organization with a minuscule membership, I might add, was reconceived as a nefarious, shadowy, underground, uh, tentacular octopus of depravity, um, hell-bent on dethroning um, the clerics, religion in more generally, and conservative morality. And that's how it bulks large in the conspiratorial unconscious to this day. So having knitted together all those strands, um, Chansley urges us in his book to step back. 
and to see these far-flung dots coalesce into a constellation of conspiracies whose ultimate goal is nothing less than, quote, the deep state takeover of our nation through corrupt laws and the government's misuse of force. Now it can be told. What I wasn't prepared for in reading One Mind at a Time was just how closely it harmonizes with the worldviews of public intellectuals like Robert F. Kennedy Jr., a respected environmental activist turned anti-vaccination crusader, Naomi Wolf, the feminist pundit reborn as a COVID truther, and Mark Crispin Miller, an NYU professor of media studies and one-time progressive who ran afoul of his colleagues for his, quote, espousal of non-evidence-based conspiracy theories, including the belief that cell phones cause cancer and the moon landing was fake, and most controversially, his promotion of anti-mask, anti-vaccine misinformation in the middle of a pandemic. Their reflexive mistrust of official narratives and fervent embrace of conspiracy theories makes all three sound at times as if they're channeling Chansley. Take Kennedy, whose iconic name has made him a super spreader of popular delusions. He believes Bill Gates is behind a diabolical scheme to control the population by injecting us via COVID vaccines with microchips. That 5G, quote, causes DNA dysfunction, whatever that is, and famously that vaccines cause autism, a thoroughly debunked theory typical of the anti-vaxxer falsehoods that got him banned from Instagram. Wolf has suggested that the Moderna vaccine is a, quote, software platform that can receive uploads, unquote, that Apple has developed a quote, new tech to deliver vaccines with nanoparticles, don't ask me, that let you travel back in time, unquote, and that Dr. Fauci, the CDC, Big Pharma, and Bill and Melinda Gates are part of a monstrous conspiracy using vaccination passports as a stalking horse to strip Americans of their rights and impose a totalitarian regime straight out of 1984. As for Miller, he's a 9-11 truther, a Sandy Hook skeptic who suspects the school shootings were a quote-unquote false flag operation staged to provide a pretext for a crackdown on Second Amendment rights and a vociferous opponent of masking lockdowns and vaccines, which he, like Wolf and Kennedy, believes are a prelude to something called the Great Reset a globalist plot cooked up by George Soros, the Rockefellers, Ted Turner, and because no conspiracy would be complete without him, Bill Gates, to eradicate the mass of humanity so the uber-rich can have the planet all to themselves, a brave new world founded on eugenic principles, ruled by the 1% and maintained by a slave class, which is you and me if we're lucky. And you'll recall me saying or citing a study earlier that showed that if you believe one conspiracy theory, you're likely to believe more. And that is abundantly evidenced in all three of these individuals. But how did the scion of America's most storied political dynasty, the author of a feminist classic that has influenced generations, Naomi Wolf's book, The Beauty Myth, and a once respected media critic, end up on the same page as a QAnon cultist whose book reads like Don DeLillo on DMT. Kennedy, Wolf, and Miller are some species of liberal, or were. Their conspiracism has alienated the left and on many issues aligned them with the right. Chansley is a member, by contrast, of what I like to call the Trumpian proletariat. All three have advanced degrees, Chansley, by comparison, is a graduate of Google U. What they and Chansley have in common is the knee-jerk suspicion that all government and all establishment media narratives, all expert opinions are, 
rank propaganda. This wariness is coupled paradoxically with a willingness to believe any counter narrative, no matter how dubiously sourced or implausible, as long as it confirms their biases. I call this the X-Files paradox. Those of you who uh, were fans of the 90s show, uh, which was all about conspiracy theory, will remember that it had three taglines over the course of its multi-season run. Trust no one was only one of the taglines. The other two were the truth is out there and I want to believe. And that kind of um, epistemological dissonance um, bedevils suspicious minds and characterizes, on the one hand, the utter unwillingness on the part of most conspiracy theorists to credence anything said by the government or established media or members of the expert elite, coupled bizarrely with an almost depthless credulity when it comes to preposterous claims found on the interwebs, like Jewish space lasers started the fires in Northern California, for example. Now, minority reports such as the anti-vaccine fear-mongering of the British gastroenterologist Andrew Wakefield, in their minds, Trump expert consensus every time. The pariah status of discredited professionals like Wakefield who lost his license for falsely claiming that he discovered a link between the MMR, that is measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, and autism, is proof to the conspiracy-minded of the truth, truth of their allegations. Why else would gatekeepers in various fields and their lazy brain lackeys in the media go to such lengths to quote-unquote smear discredited professionals like Lake Wakefield and quote unquote suppress their explosive revelations. They must be telling the truth. In raising doubts about public health authorities like Fauci, the CDC, and the WHO, Kennedy, Wolf, and Miller see themselves as standard bearers of 60s radicalism. Question authority, the counterculture shibboleth, could easily do double duty as Chansley's battle cry and theirs. So could, quote, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they aren't after you. One of the best known quotes from Joseph Heller's absurdist anti-war novel, Catch-22, much loved by student radicals in the 1960s. Conspiracism is a counterculture a counterculture of counter narratives, and nowhere more so than in QAnon, which knits believers into a hive mind that decodes the cryptic transmissions, or Q drops as they're called, of a purported mole in the deep state. He goes by the name Q. Then jigsaws those puzzle pieces into an oppositional myth about the unspeakable evil gnawing at the heart of American democracy and the, quote, God-loving, country-protecting patriots, unquote, like Chansley, on a crusade to save it. Chansley questions authority, but his style of radical will, as Sontag would say, is refracted through the conspiritualist apocalypse apocalypticism of QAnon, and equally through Trump Nation's depthless contempt for Congress, the swamp, and the fake news media, a mindset shaped by the GOP's decades-long propaganda campaign to vilify and delegitimize big government and the liberal media. Asked by the BBC's Channel 4 News, at what point in your life did you stop listening to the mainstream narrative? Chansley replied, when I realized that doing my own research brought me more information than listening to the news ever could. Once I stopped allowing the news to make up my mind or my narrative for me, I grew exponentially. Now, um, Chansley's use of the viral phrase, doing my research, my own research is instructive. Um, every QAnon cultist is a self-styled researcher, convinced that his or her Google erudition is a license to question authority. 
They're symptomatic of our moment when the hierarchy flattening web makes everyone a critic and everyone an expert. For example, called on the carpet by his department chair for his skepticism about the efficacy of masking and other pandemic measures, Mark Crispin Miller was incredulous in a podcast interview with Joseph Merkelaw, whom the New York Times has called the most influential spreader of coronavirus misinformation online, and you'll note that his book has a foreword by RFK Jr. Birds of a feather really do flock together. Um, Crispin Miller was incredulous, he told Mercola, when his chair asked him, do you think you know more than the doctors at NYU? The question left Miller speechless, he claimed. I didn't even know what to say to that, he told Mercola. I re read the studies, which showed, in Miller's opinion, that, quote, masks are not effective as a barrier to transmission of respiratory vi viruses. And then Miller went on to say, that's all I can say. And I understand English. He does indeed. But what he doesn't understand is virology or epidemiology or vaccinology. Medical science is science and facts are facts, says Nina Burley, whose book Virus, Vaccinations, the CDC, and the Hijacking of America's Response to the Pandemic touches on the question of COVID conspiracism. She told me, you can have an informed opinion about, for example, um, economic policies that affect the frail and the poor, but you can't have an opinion on the details of a heart surgery if you're not a heart surgeon or about the best chemotherapy if you're not an oncologist. You're simply hopelessly out of your depth. The thing is, if everything is a narrative and nothing but a narrative, a tale told by an unreliable narrator, bent on cover-up or propaganda, then science isn't science, and facts aren't facts. The key word there, as in Chansley's interview with the BBC, is narrative. For Chansley, Miller, Wolf, and Kennedy, as for most of us, mental life is a welter of media narratives, tweets, posts, podcasts, cable news, commercials, papers of record, pop-up ads, talk radio, YouTube channels, websites, blogs, newsletters, subreddits, TikToks. And in this regard, I'll just um, mention that one of the salience of our historical moment, information overload and the flattened hierarchies on the web that I mentioned earlier, and the disruption of official gatekeepers, such as we had back in the days when there were only three networks and famously Walter Cronkite was sort of America's dad and father knew, knew best. Um, these um, historical saliences, I call them, again, work against us to make it extremely difficult to separate competing truth claims. But what distinguishes the way that conspiracists read uh, narratives, however, is a mentality that takes, quote, the hermeneutics of suspicion to extremes. Coined by the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur, the term refers to a form of textual analysis that assumes the narrative is there to conceal, not reveal. The truth is under its floorboards, buried in the crawl space of the subtext and like all buried things, is never pretty to look at when exhumed. My definition of conspiracy theory, Mark Miller likes to say, is something that if true, you couldn't handle it, which really opens the door to the abyss of credulity I mentioned earlier. If the proof that something is true is that it is so incredible that common sense bridles at it and our rational minds recoil from it, then that's a paradoxical recipe for believing virtually anything. 
It puts me in mind of the White Queen in Alice in Wonderland, who in response to Alice's laughing dismissal, one can't believe impossible things, rejoins, I dare say you haven't had much practice. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. And as we saw a moment ago, Wolf, Miller, uh, Kennedy, and Chansley all believe at least six impossible things. The hermeneutics of suspicion is more than an analytic method, argues the literary theorist Rita Felsky. It's a state of mind. This entrenching of suspicion intensifies the impulse to decipher and decode, she writes in her book, The Limits of Critique. The suspicious person is sharp-eyed and hyper-alert, mistrustful of appearances, fearful of being duped, always on the lookout for concealed threats and discreditable motives. In short, more suspicion means ever more interpretation. Conspiracy theory is what happens when the hermeneutics of suspicion escapes the page into the wild. Anything can be disinformation, propaganda, psyops, a sign, a symbol, a subliminal message, evidence of dark designs and covert operations hidden in plain sight. Where you and I see a stylized arrowhead in the logo of the Arrowhead Town Center Mall in Glendale, Arizona, Chansley sees a, quote, pedophile code as the sign he waved at a 2020 Trump event proclaimed. This symbol says, he told the interviewer, that Arrowhead Mall is a safe haven for certain people with certain tastes, in particular man-boy love. He told a TV crew, adding in a gift to comedy gold miners all over the web, that's not just me talking out my rear end here. All the globalist schemes are, quote, hidden in plain sight in just this type of symbolism, he says. You've got to read between the lines. Look for certain code words like pasta or pizza. And if the pizza sign has, like, devil horns or something, that's something to watch out for, okay? The Arizona sun winks off the upswept horns on his headdress. The assassination of JFK and the Warren Report's suspiciously tidy verdict that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone, regarded by many as a foregone conclusion intended to quell conspiracy theories, marked the beginning of baby boomers' loss of faith in authorities and institutions. The assassination left an emptiness that made everything plausible, made us susceptible to the most incredible ideas and fantasies, Don DeLillo told a BBC interviewer. Riffing on his novel Libra about those six seconds in Dallas, he said, we couldn't seem to find out what happened, even on the most basic level. How many gunmen? How many shots? How many wounds on the president's body? There was no coherent reality we could analyze and study. So we became a little paranoid. We developed a sense of the secret manipulation of history. Documents lost or destroyed, official records sealed for 50 years, a number of very suspicious murders and suicides. Since Dallas, we see conspiracy everywhere. And sure enough, one mind at a time begins with a quote from a 1961 speech by President Kennedy. Quote, for we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covert means for expanding its sphere of influence. Now, obviously, the Cold War was on, and Kennedy was conjuring the specter of Soviet expansion. But Chansley, adept at the hermeneutics of suspicion, isn't having any of it. He reads between the lines, writing, the deep state is the system which Kennedy spoke of. A conspiracy marshalling, in Kennedy's words, quote, vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine. The assassination of JFK casts a long shadow across Mark Crispin Miller's historical memory too. 2020 really began to slouch toward us in 1963. You know what I'm saying? He told a crowd of COVID skeptics, anti-vaxxers, and assorted truthers at a rally in 2021. It really sort of starts in Dallas on November 22, right? By it, 
of course he means the conspiracy. JFK committed, quote, crimes against that network, that syndicate and its interests, Miller told the crowd. Quote, that got him killed. RFK Jr. would surely agree. Both his father and his uncle were the victims, he believes, of conspiracies. Now, of course, the idea that our confidence in institutions and authorities was shattered by three shots in Dallas, or more precisely by the Warren Report, which about 60% of Americans continue to believe was a cover-up of the conspiracy behind JFK's murder, is a little too pat. Depending on which racial or political demographic you belong to, you might start the clock at a different point. Maybe it was the murder of Martin Luther King Jr. or of Malcolm X, or the exposure in 1972 of the Tuskegee experiment in which generations of black men were injected with syphilis without being told and then given no medication for it and simply observed as the, as the disease progressed and took its toll by the American government. Or the church committee's mind-curdling revelations in 1975 of MK Ultra and COINTELPRO, or the one-two punch of Vietnam Watergate. Trust in government began eroding during the 1960s amid the escalation of the Vietnam War and the decline continued in the 1970s with the Watergate scandal, a 2021 report by the Pew Research Center asserts. In 1958, quote, about three quarters of Americans trusted the federal government to do the right thing, almost always or most of the time, according to Pew. But quote, since 2007, the share saying they can trust the government always or most of the time has never surpassed 30% of the American public. And as you might imagine, among conservatives, that number is substantially lower. But it, if it was the gravitational pull of those historical events that caused our confidence in authorities, institutions, and official narratives to collapse into an epistemological black hole, DeLillo's, quote, emptiness that made everything plausible, unquote, it's the far right's weaponization of that uncertainty, which we're all prey to, that spread the virus of conspiracism. Newt Gingrich, the Republican Speaker of the House, whose declared goal was, quote, reshaping the entire nation through the news media, unquote, pioneered the tactic of demonizing and discrediting the, quote, liberal media elite as well as the very Congress he served in, incredibly, <laughs> or for that matter, anything that stood in the way of his brand of pugnacious right-wing populism. Fox News turned Gingrich's kill the messenger strategy into an insanely profitable outrage machine. Trump transformed Fox's red meat demagoguery into a wrecking ball assault on, quote, the regime of truth, unquote, as the philosopher Michel Foucault called it, the dominant discourses and adjudicating bodies that determine what in a given society is true or false. Now, that long-term propaganda drive has undermined trust in government. A 2021 Pew Repol poll reported that 36% of Democrats and Democratic-leaning independents say they can trust government, compared with 9% of Republicans and Republican leaners. Republican confidence in science has taken a hit, too, plunging to 45% since a 1975 survey, says Gallup, whereas Democrats has increased to 79%. And distrust of the, quote, fake news media is unsurprisingly off the charts. On the right, 58% of Republicans told Gallup they have, quote, no trust and confidence in the media whatsoever, versus 6% of Democrats. An unrepentant birther who spewed misinformation, disinformation, and conspiracist bilge Throughout his presidency, Trump, our first troll-in-chief 
and sitting conspiracist as president, continues to claim against all evidence that he won the 2020 election, but a vast left-wing conspiracy stole it from him. The ability to tell a bald-faced lie without blinking, to stonewall and parse and prevaricate, to spin the press silly with stage media events, and what the historian Gary Wills called Ronald Reagan's choreography of candor, have long been job qualifications for American politicians. But Trump took the war and the very notions of empirical fact and nonpartisan truth to epistemologically dizzying extremes. And his tactics are now the default mode on the right, from the Orwellian doublespeak of GOP machers like Mitch McConnell, to self-dealing disruptors like Ted Cruz, to the weaponized irony of Fox News propagandists like Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram, to the conspiracy-addled jabber of Trumpist trolls cosplaying as politicians like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert. Trump's insistence that we're entitled not just to our own opinions, <laughs> um, a little visit from the emoji god there, um, but to our own alternative facts is now an article of faith on the right. That mindset is the cornerstone of conspiracism. Now, Jack Bradich, um, a professor at Rutgers University, seen here uh, lecturing at Pitzer, is the author of Conspiracy Panics, Political Rationality and Popular Culture. And he argued in a 2017 lecture on Trumpism, mutually assured disqualification and communications warfare, that America is in an info war with itself, a power struggle that pits the once unassailable regime of truth that Michel Foucault referred to against a million little regimes of post-truth, which British defines as mechanisms that have been designed to undermine truth by dropping rumor bombs and conspiracy theories. In a weird way, there is a bug in the operating system of American dem democracy, which is, after all, a product of the Enlightenment imagination. The founding fathers were true sons of the Enlightenment. They were committed to rationalism. They were committed to civic and civil discourse. They were committed to the scientific method. Many of them had one foot in secularism as deus. But the problem is the sticky wicket, the bug in the code, is that the Enlightenment is founded on Cartesian doubt and skeptical inquiry. So liberal democracy requires a tricky balancing act. Preaching trust in political institutions, it pays lip service, at least, to the Enlightenment skepticism that's supposed to keep those institutions honest. In theory, public eyes like the news media and congressional committees serve as checks on governmental overreach and political corruption. At the same time, they act as gatekeepers, separating legitimate skepticism from outright conspiracism. In order to perform that social role effectively, they must be seen as value-neutral arbiters of truth, an earnest 1950s fiction with few adherents in today's cynical, politically polarized America. An America that in the wake of the Warren Report, the 9-11 Commission, Trump's presidency, and the 2021 sacking of the Capitol has pretty much lost its civic religion. Now, in our time, says Bradich, Cartesian doubt and skeptical inquiry have mutated into a corrosive doubt a toxic skepticism that is not only hostile to government institutions, but has turned on all gatekeepers, igniting an epistemological duel to the death over facts and alt facts, truth and truthiness. Combatants are at war not only with their ideological arch enemies, but are joined in battle as well with um, in, in internecine combat legacy media versus fringe media, 
op-ed page pontificators versus social media hot takers, establishment Dems versus the squad, old guard conservatives versus Trump style conspiracist trolls like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert. All of Bradich's regimes of post-truth share the same strategic goal, control of the media narratives that shape mass opinion and as a result our shared reality. But the immediate effect of their epistemological attacks and counterattacks is what British calls mutually assured disqualification. And, and there he's uh, punning on the Cold War doctrine of mutually assured destruction that it was supposed to ensure the balance of nuclear powers. And the effect of that, and I have here an illustration from Edgar Allan Poe's Descent into the Maelstrom, the effect of that is what could be called epistemological vertigo our pervasive sense of being unmoored from the truth, of not knowing how to sort fact from falsehood. It's what makes so many grab onto the reassuringly black and white theology of conspiracism. And conspiracism is a theology, an unwavering moral compass in a murk of relativism and amb ambiguities, reassuringly Manichaean, that is starkly black or white, in its cosmic struggle between good and evil, apocalyptic in its conviction that we're living in the end times, as unshakable in its convictions as Bible Belt fundamentalism. Like religion, it offers belonging to a community of believers. And that's um, sort of writ small in QAnon's motto, where we go one, we go all. Think of QAnon's weird amalgam of end times cult and live action role playing or alternate reality game, whose labyrinthine stories, according to the game designer Reed Berkowitz, are designed to, quote, entice players through clever rabbit holes found in the real world that start them searching for answers. Berkowitz calls QAnon the gamification of propaganda. So it's got these sort of bizarre amalgam of qualities. It's like an end times cult. It's also um, like a LARP, a live action role playing game. Um, and it's also like fan fiction or fan culture in which part of the pleasure is kind of a collective hermeneutics in which fans decrypt a narrative and contest its meanings, argue over the text and the subtext. And also like religion, um, conspiracism is deeply teleological transforming the mind-drowning deluge of current events into a narrative where everything happens for a reason. It restores hope and meaning to lives darkened by lockdown loneliness and despair-inducing news. And that's not, it's not an accident that, that conspiracy theory has really flourished uh, during the COVID pandemic for those reasons. People are alone, they're lonely, they're isolated, and they're often very siloed in terms of their media diets. Girded for ballot, battle against Big Pharma, Big Tech, Bill Gates, Anthony Fauci, George Soros, the transhumanists, the eugenicists, and the cannibalistic child trafficking globalists and their myrmidons in the deep state, conspiracists like Kennedy and Miller and Wolf and Chansley thrill to the moral crusader's sense of being on the right side of Armageddon's battle lines. Now, some conspiracy theorists like to dismiss Richard Hofstadter's pop psych take on right-wing populism as hopelessly dated, but his classic, the first real um, serious scrutiny of uh, conspiracy theory, The Paranoid Style in American Politics, published in 1965, written with communist witch hunter Joseph McCarthy, and then fringe groups like the rabidly conspiracist John Burke Society in mind, still rings true in its analysis of conspiracism's religious undertones. History to the conspiracist is a conspiracy, wrote Hofstadter. And I would add that it, it's kind of like pareidolia or apophenia applied to the historical arc. One sees patterns, patterns everywhere, like the mad semiotician Casabon in Umberto Echo's The Name of the Rose. Um, so it, history is a conspiracy, says Hofstetter, set in motion by demonic forces of almost transcendent power. And what is 
felt to be needed to defeat is not the usual methods of political give and take, but an all out crusade. And 20% of the respondents to a 2021 poll by the Public Research Institute said they believed a biblical scale storm would soon sweep away evil elites and restore the rightful leaders. Four in 10 QAnoners told pollsters they thought that the COVID-19 vaccine contains a surveillance microchip that is the sign of the beast in biblical prophecy. There is a war on humanity, there is a war on religion, there is a war on human assembly, said Naomi Wolf on Fox News primetime. Big tech wants to drive everyone indoors and dissolve the bonds between people. Hofstetter's ghost reminds us, like religious millenarians, conspiracists express the anxiety of those who are living through the last days. And now I will uh, I'm sure to everyone's uh, immense release, <laughs> relief, <laughs> wrap up quickly. Um, sure enough, one mind at a time ends in Times Square preacher mode with Chansley slash Angeli prophesying that, quote, America is right on time to fall as all empires do at her age. At the same time, his new age conspirituality shines through concluding with a flurry of platitudes that wouldn't be out of place at one of Gwyneth Paltrow's wellness summits, he calls for, quote, nonviolent conscious rebellion, offers, quote, a vision of a better tomorrow, reviles the rigged system of winner-take-all capitalism, invades against the military-industrial complex and its death technologies. If you've ever wondered what the audiobook of the Whole Earth Catalog, read by Sean Penn's perpetually baked Jeff Spicoli from Fast Times at Ridgemont High would sound like, wonder no more. Quote, on, uh, quote, imagine if the entire world started using hemp instead of wood, writes Angeli. Imagine if we used hempcrete instead of concrete. Cities of the future will float in the sky. Disease will be a thing of the past. Time travel and telekinesis will become normal. Unquote. We'll look back on the old bogus world from, quote, a higher dimensional perspective of conscious energetic vibratory frequency, unquote. Pass the gummies, will you? Of course, that was before Mr. Chansley went to Washington, before he swaggered grinning into the Senate chamber with a fucking A, man before he announced that he was going to take a selfie in the vice president's chair because, quote, Mike Pence is a fucking traitor, unquote, before he led the assembled insurrectionists in a prayer in which he thanked the Lord for, quote, allowing us to get rid of the communists, the globalists, and the traitors within our government, unquote. At that very moment, elsewhere in the building, insurrectionists willing to die for the conspiratorial big lie that Donald Trump won the election, but a conspiracy stole it from him, were tasing, bear spraying, and immune to irony, using flagpoles flying old glory to bludgeon to death if they had their way, Capitol Police. Chansley ended with a benediction, thanking God for filling this chamber with the divine, omnipresent white light of love and protection, peace and harmony. Filled with the spirit of benevolence, he propped his spear against the desk and finding a pen and paper, scrawled a note to the vice president. It's only a matter of time Justice is coming. Coming from a self-described multidimensional being whose book ends with preachments about everyone being of one peaceful mind in the love space, it strikes a barbarous note. Thank you very much for your extraordinary patience and having held you hostage for over an hour, I am now happy to be your prisoner for any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, again, please feel free to write your questions in the chat or the Q&A. Um, we do have one to get us started. Um, and this one, again, kind of touching on the conspiracy theories that we 
went over, are there any that come from the left as well? Um, and you may have already touched on these through the presentation they mentioned. Yeah, the reason that I emphasize the right is that conspiracists are in fact, and this is borne out by numerous polls, disproportionately represented on the right, and more to the point, as I argued in my uh, lecture, the weaponization of conspiracy by uh, Alex Jones on Infowars, Breitbart.com, and most notably Fox News, whose reach is astonishing, and which has radicalized many of what were previously old guard, relatively uh, moderate, um, uh, older white male Republicans. Um, that being said, the left is not at all innocent of conspiracy theory, and um, self-described liberals and progressives are represented, most notably among anti-vaxxers. There are also leftists among 9-11 truthers who are absolutely persuaded that George Bush orchestrated the fall of the two towers and colluded with nefarious actors uh, to bring that about. Um, so there are those on, on the sort of Burning Man wellness left who, because of their predisposition to alternative medicine, as I mentioned, and a deep hostility toward institutional mes uh, medicine, specifically when it comes to vaccines, um, but also to technology, you know, when it comes to 5G, for example, um, subscribe to some of these conspiracy theories. But numerically, they are inarguably a smaller percentage of conspiracy nation. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I heard a, a lot about that with the anti-vaccine movement as well. So I'm glad I wasn't mistaken with my knowledge on that. Not at all. Uh, and, and wealthy white women of the goop persuasion um, are sort of at the forefront of that. And many of them have then um, slipped by degrees into QAnon belief. We have another question as well. Um, that's looking at, we talked a lot about the divisions and kind of how conspiracy theories cause harm, but are there any ways that, or any thoughts you have on the ways we can heal this division or rediscover a common reality? Or do you think we're too far gone to, to rec reconcile with that? Yeah, that's the riddle of the Sphinx. And I don't have an easy answer for that. And one, problem, of course, in, in mentioning um, radical doubt or corrosive skepticism on the left, as I did a moment ago, I'll also note that the um, skepticism about established authority in the expert class um, also begins on the left in the 1960s. You know, the um, JFK conspiracy theory is kind of an equal opportunity employer. And I will say that that's um, a conspiracy about which reasonable minds can reasonably disagree. You know, um, believing that uh, Oswald did not act alone is not the forehead stamp of a rank conspiracist. Um, there's certainly a lot of shadows swimming beneath the ice when it comes to the assassination of JFK, whether it's um, Castro's hostility toward JFK, whom he had repeatedly attempted to assassinate, uh, JFK and RFK's um, familiarity with and proximity to La Cosa Nostra, the mafia. Um, but there are also legitimate reasons for the left to mistrust authority beginning in the 1950s and 60s. Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, about the use of DDT, um, the revelations about COINTELPRO, and then later on Watergate, and after that Contragate, show that in point of fact, there have been uh, so-called deep state actors within the American government pursuing their own shadowy ends and contravening um, congressional will. So suspicion of authority is not 
on its face prima facie a bad thing, but I think we have to disentangle expertise from authority. So for example, someone like Fauci or climate scientists who go up against the fossil fuel industry and right-wing media that creates a false equivalency between climate scientists' claims about um, anthropogenic warming, so-called global warming, and the claim, claims of scientists who are in the pocket of the fossil fuel industry and who represent a minuscule percentage of climate science, um, that's kind of really destabilized things. And, and so we, in terms of addressing these beliefs, one thing we can do when we encounter individuals who subscribe to them is simply walk the beliefs back. You're never going to convince somebody who believes that the World Trade Towers couldn't have happened as the 9-11 Commission determined they did because quote unquote, jet fuel cannot melt steel, right? But you, you can ask them what the motivation would have been for example, for George W. Bush doing that. And you can start to walk it back and um, try to reason with them about the political logic behind that. You know, the last people in the world Bush would have wanted to have blamed, blamed would be the Saudis. You know, he and his father had the royal family on speed dial. They were merrily in bed with Saudi royalty when it came to geopolitical power. And yet Bush did identify uh, the links between uh, the Saudi Arabian uh, power elite and the 9-11 bombers. So it would have been political suicide for him to do that. There's simply no motivation for him. So you can try to reason with people about that. Um, and you can also make the case for um, expert elites um, as being not part of an elite, but simply being warehouses of knowledge. And you can ask them, you know, if you had a brain tumor, would you want to do your own neurosurgery? You know, and it's it try to focus on ways in which our internal logic doesn't cohere. If we're going to saw off the bow we're sitting on when it comes to expertise, we don't get to pick and choose. If we're going to reject climate scientists who have degrees from Stanford, you know, in climatology, then we should reject our dental hygienist, right? And our endocrinologist, you know, or our, um, you know, cancer surgeon. But if an individual subscribes to expertise in those areas, then try to ask them um, why they don't concomitantly subscribe to expertise in some of the other areas they're contesting. They seem to feel entirely entitled to contest Dr. Fauci or a vaccinologist or an epidemiologist, but um, are perfectly comfortable with genuflecting to their automotive mechanic when it comes to problems under the hood. So you can get them to sort of see that the internal incoherence in their worldview. Thank you for that. I think that touched on a lot of people's questions I see in the chat, kind of referring to how we can support people to try to come out of these conspiracy theories as well. Um, that it, it is kind of a challenge and with the emotional and the intellectual side of things combined in there. It's an it's enormous challenge. And I know you're trying to get to the other questions. And I, don't, and I want to answer as many as possible, Jacob. But I will also say that, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the evidence suggests that human beings, you know, if we want to claim any species of exceptionalism, it is that we are meaning-making creatures. I mean, those in the audience who've read the philosopher Martin Heidegger know that Heidegger teaches that human beings are hermeneutes. We walk through the world recognizing patterns, but more to the point, we use pattern recognition to infuse our lives with meaning. The essayist Joan Didion famously said, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. And I like to say that conspiracy theory is the moment where narratology, the study of narratives, meets demonology, a kind of a Man Manichaean, black or white cosmic worldview. And um, it really is narratology gone off the rails. And we live at a historical moment when 
because of the flattening of hierarchies created by the web, because we have borne witness to actual conspiracies. You know, we have been pummeled by one conspiracy after another in the 20th century. The Third Reich was built on a conspiracy theory about nefarious Jewish world domination. Watergate really was a conspiracy. Contragate was a conspiracy. MK Ultra and Cointel Pro, as I mentioned earlier, were conspiracies. So that has very rightfully eroded trust in institutions and authorities, and yet people crave meaning in their lives. And isolated poisoned by propaganda and their media, silo, media silos, they will cling to um, consoling fictions and oppositional myths that they find harmonize with their life experiences. And that's what conspiracy theory is. It offers the consolations of philosophy, but in the darkest, most apocalyptic way. Yeah, and I'm seeing a lot of questions kind of related to this as well Is kind of how the role of the internet and the monetization of in information have affected conspiracy theories. Um, and of course, uh, kind of being recent in the news, the Elon Musk takeover of Twitter and what that's looked like. So could you speak in anything about the role of technology in this new age and how that's been affecting this? Absolutely. That's a spectacular question. I mean, one of the foremost, uh, I love the phrase, conspiracy theory theorists is a professor named Joseph Yuzinski, who I believe is the, the University of Miami. And um, he often cites exhaustive polls that he's done. He's a professor of political science that show that, um, confoundingly, technology, specifically the internet, isn't really the petri dish full of agar for culturing um, the, uh, you know, um, pernicious spores of conspiracy theory that in the gothic mass unconscious we believe it to be. Um, I find Yuzinski's data a little perplexing, and I suspect he's asking the wrong question. You know, if we ask what percentage of Americans subscribe to a wackadoodle theory like QAnon, right, or the moon landing, which is that the moon landing was faked by Stanley Kubrick and that The Shining is full of Easter eggs revealing that, you know, <laughs> Danny Torrance is wearing a t-shirt with Apollo 11 on it in one scene. Um, you know, these in a way are the preposterous examples that de deflect our attention from the conspiracy theories hidden in plain sight and the actual corrosive effects of the weaponization of algorithms for profit maximization. So um, the conspiracy theorists watching this video or listening to it live um, need not puzzler their puzzlers till they're sore, as the Grinch says, I will fully disclose that I am a card-carrying member of the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, that doesn't mean that I credulously um, sign on to every point in the DSA agenda, but I am some species of um, kind of capricious um, leftist. Um, but for that reason, I look to the effects of capitalism in many of these cases. So let's take Dr. Joseph Merkula, who I mentioned earlier, right, who opines on vaccinology and epidemiology and virology and always insists on being referred to as doctor, but he's an osteopath, right? He's not a vaccinologist. He's not a virologist. He's not an epidemiologist. And to, uh, with all apologies to Stephen Jay Gould, uh, this is an example of non-overlapping magisteria, right? <laughs> magisteria is your, your bailiwick, your discursive zone, uh, the area in which you have expertise. 
one of the first things we should look at, you know, if you're talking to a friend who's a conspiracy theorist who cites a lot of these doctors who've gone rogue, is virtually none of them are experts in the area in which they're opining. So the first question to ask is, well, yes, he's an MD, but what is he an MD of? In this case, osteopathy, which is a kind of a paralegitimate um, sub sub discourse of mainstream medicine in any event. It's viewed um, somewhat askance um, by mainstream medicine. That's neither, that's a debate for another day. Um, but the point is that he's holding forth in an area that is not really within his purview. Why is he doing this? Well, sure enough, he does a land office business in patent nostrums and quack medicines meant to either cure COVID or forestall its onset. Gary Null, featured on WBAI in New York and the Pacific Network, a notorious anti-vaxxer and COVID denialist in many ways, also uh, is doing a land office business in vitamin supplements and diet books. And the same, same is true for Alex Jones. I mean, the conspiracy theories are the bait on the end of the hook. The way that they're really making money is through merch and through dietary supplements and books about, you know, how to cure cancer and patent nostrums and quack medicines of all sorts. Now, when it comes to, so capitalism, you know, the invisible hand that Adam Smith was so sanguine about is absolutely stealthily operant in that sphere. But um, algorithms, which have been punningly called malgorithms, malevolent algorithms, are also at work on YouTube, as everyone knows or should knows. There's a tropism toward the extreme in which algorithms will suggest ever more extreme material, even if you're looking at Alex Jones's videos or Joseph Merkel's videos, because you're a conspiracy scholar like myself, in the right-hand column, YouTube will helpfully recommend still more extreme videos. Why? Because the what was once um, idiomatically called the reptilian hindbrain, the limbic system, right, which is our uh, sort of evolutionary holdover, the fight and flight aspect of us, is what gets us really engaged. So op outrage pays, and the more outrage uh, outraged Facebook or Twitter or YouTube can make you, the stickier that platform is. The more you'll stick around, the further you'll go down, the deeper uh, deeper you'll go down the rabbit hole, and the more those platforms can charge advertisers. And so they are, you know, taking a wrecking ball to democracy, even as they're fattening their profit margins. So thank you for the question. It's absolutely on point. Yeah, and I see we're almost at 8.30, so I think this is a good question to end on, is who would you recommend in our current day of writers, singers, filmmakers, advocates that are giving us the, the sources or the tools to fight against this or giving us the hope that we're not all going to devolve into the conspiracy theories? Well, you know, here I will wear my, um, you know, uh, I'll fly the red flag and wear my leftism uh, for all to see. But astonishingly, um, I forget how old he is. He's become a virtually Methuselah sage, but Noam Chomsky now well into his 90s and and now looking every inch the old testament prophet is doing these astonishing ask me anything with people your age jacob and younger um and he continues to be um staggeringly erudite um lungingly quick off the mark and um seemingly has eidetic, you know, recall, you know, um, sort of photographic memory of everything he's ever read. And so um, he's uh, kind of, for my money, an unerring uh, compass, intellectual compass when it comes to s sorting out competing truth claims. Um, Jeff Charlotte uh, is a writer I would commend to everyone's attention 
those of you interested in conspiracy theory and um, uh, specifically the religious rights role in both QAnon, where they were disproportionately represented in the insurrection on January 6th and in and this is a real life conspiracy, the decades long conspiracy to flip the Supreme Court and corrupt it from an adjudicating body that was supposed to be politically nonpartisan into the most far right, transparently partisan court we've ever had. Uh, Jeff Charlotte is your go to man, and he's got a fantastic book coming out. Um, next uh, uh, in 2023 called The Undertow. And the pair of the subtitle is something like A Civil War in Slow Motion. And he went into the heartland of um, Trump's American carnage and interviewed countless conspiracists, um, Christian nationalists, so-called Christo-fascists, and ultra magas about their worldview. So it's a core sample of the American id. Charlotte, many of you will know from his Netflix series, The Family, which is about another astonishing real-life conspiracy um, by a far-right, ultra-religious, bizarrely libertarian group of Christo-fascists who cite in their writings people like Pol Pot, Mao Zedong, and Adolf Hitler as exemplars of uh, a way to take over a society. And they have been stealthily working for decades to infiltrate the highest reaches of power. And this sounds like the uh, hairy-eyed ravings of a far leftist, but read Charlotte's book, The Family, which is a gargantuan and compendious book, exhaustively researched with hundreds, if not thousands of footnotes to materials all available in the public record. Um, and it is um, Mephistophelian in its monstrosity. It's simply surreal beyond all imagining. So Jeff Charlotte, I would commend to, to everyone in the audience who wants to really do a deep dive into the uh, heart of American darkness when it comes to conspiracism and uh, the devil's bargain that the evangelical right, right has struck with conspiracism. Thank you so much for that. And I believe Jeff Charlotte is uh, a professor at Dartmouth, according to my quick Google search here. Um, yes, indeed. For, for the, okay, perfect. So we found the right person. <laughs> um, well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Mark, this was an incredible presentation. I know it left me with a lot of things I wanna explore more into as well. So I appreciate you for opening the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories for a lot of us. <laughs> thank you so much, Jacob, for having me. And thanks so much to the Vermont Humanities Council, which is doing extraordinary work providing a forum for a thoughtful discourse like this. I'm very much in their debt, and I think they are uh, an extraordinary credit to the great state of Vermont. So it's been my um, unalloyed pleasure to be here. Thanks so much to all the participants for going the distance, and anyone whose question didn't get answered should feel free to email me. <laughs>